Welcome to the Italian Academy this evening. I'm sorry, um, this is going to be a slightly longer introduction than usual, because I think this is an important event. It is an important event. It marks the first public lecture of the Academy's International Observatory for Cultural Heritage, as well as the establishment of the Weinberg Fellowships in Architectural History and Conservation, for which we are most grateful and which have already garnered much attention. So when the Academy established its International Observatory for Cultural Heritage last year, the first person we knew we needed with us was Salvatore Settis. And we could not be more fortunate that Salvatore agreed to be the very first distinguished senior fellow amidst our first crop of fellows this year, our first crop of fellows in the field of, in the um, Observatory for Cultural Heritage. For Salvatore is not only one of our great scholars of classical and Renaissance art, but also someone who has fought more powerfully than anyone I know on behalf of cultural heritage, not only on the academic front, but above all on the popular one. He, if anyone, can speak with authority about the importance of the remains of both ancient and modern cultures, eloquently, clearly, and compellingly. He has done so in his powerful books and his countless timely articles over the years. His is a voice that has reached millions. I thought about that millions, and I thought, that's a big claim. But I think it's absolutely true, because he writes quite consistently for many of the Europe's most important newspapers. You can pick up the Repubblica or the Corriere any day of the week, and Salvatore Settis is there pleading on behalf of cultural heritage. His is a, so that goes. And he's also spoken more courageously about the importance of cultural conservation than most people we know. Indeed, he accepted our invitation to come here, well knowing what difficulty it might cause if he arrived at a US airport in these times with a passport containing Iranian stamps where he had just been to Iran to talk precisely about cultural conservation issues there and ways in which Italy might bring some assistance to that scene. You know, this is going to be a personal moment. I hope I'm not going to offend too many people, but you'll understand, I think. We have had many distinguished Italian professors here over the years. All have indeed made major contributions to scholarship. But many, as some of you well know, behave as they are famously supposed to do, like Baroni, barons of the academic world. Of course, most, many non-Italians, mostly men, do that as well. But if anyone were entitled to behave like a barone, it is Salvatore Settis. After all, he was head of Italy's most prestigious academic institution, the Scuola Normale Superiore of Pisa, for many years. And that long tenure was sort of interrupted by his five-year stint as director of the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles between 94 and 99. We knew, of course, that Salvatore was a gentleman, but we never anticipated his extraordinary renunciation of almost every aspect of the legendary baronial role which custom would have assigned to him. He could not have been more patient, patient with us this semester, less demanding, less high maintenance, another baronial characteristic, or kinder, more engaging, more tolerant, or more patiently constructive with all of us. We have both been honored by your presence, Salvatore, and have learned lessons in grace as well as erudition from you. For Salvatore's contributions to our seminar are like the opening to his great recent book, If Venice Dies, which you should all rush out and buy if you haven't already done so. I'm not behaving like the lady from New Jersey over Ivanka Trump, or what is she, the daughter of Trump and her jewelry. Um, but I do think this is a book which we need to read and you will enjoy reading. You may think you know something about a subject, but Salvatore knows both the details and and the larger contexts of things, which he describes with magisterial ease, so that all you want to do 
is to begin reading. And not only are you hooked, you aspire to the kind of learning that he embodies. I wasn't actually going to read from this, but this is so good I can't resist it, if you'll allow me. Cities tend to die in three ways. When a ruthless enemy destroys them, like Carthage, Carthage, which Rome raised in 146 BC, when foreign invaders violently colonize them, driving out the indigenous inhabitants and their gods, in the case of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztecs, when the Spanish conquistadores destroyed it in 1521 to build Mexico City atop its ruins, or finally, when their citizens forget who they are and become strangers to themselves and thereby their own worst enemies without even realizing it. This happened to the city of Athens, which after experiencing the glory of its class, where, for example, if you want to see the Palazzo Schipanoia in all its splendor, the frescoes are so destroyed, but you go there and you can see, and I think we just have now the Scuola di San Marco, which has just come out um, uh, under his guidance, a splendid volume. And then there are the introductions to books by authors that range from the old masters, Jean Cesnec and Fritz Axel and Otto Brendel, who taught here, to his friends and his students. Without him, much less. I had better stop before I go on with this list. I should forego the list of honors, awards, medals and boards. I'm not going to go into those. I had best not tell the stories how, I, how, how he has helped me as he has helped so many others at various stages of their careers. In fact, he was really responsible for encouraging Einaudi to publish the first translation of my own, The Power of Images, for example, within a year of its publication. We, I don't want to go into all this because we want to hear the man himself speak. So when I referred to Salvatore's wonderful If Venice Dies, I kept one aspect of what I wanted to say to the end. Right at the outset, he acknowledges that he knows that beauty cannot do everything. That just like Prince Mishkin in The Idiot, beauty cannot save the world. We have to know, he says, how to save it. We have to know our culture, our history, our memory. It's about this that Salvatore will speak this evening. Indeed, he will speak about knowing what we do not know. When I asked our seminar here at the Academy yesterday what was paradoxical about this evening's title, Greek and Roman Drawing in the Renaissance Imagination, few amongst our scientists and economists and so on could respond. But of course, the paradox is precisely in the precision of the title. There were, as some of you know at least, there are no, there were, certainly in the Renaissance, no surviving drawings. Very small number, perhaps. Not even those that can be found drawn, for example, in the amazing Artemidorus papyrus which Salvatore published in 2008, to the wonder and stupefaction of all. So these are not, even these extraordinary drawings were not known in the Renaissance. They knew no drawings. They may have known derivations of drawings that did not know no drawings. So the question is precisely how what is lost can be represented in our imagination. How what is lost can be ameliorated in our imagination. And how, under the guidance of a scholar of genius like Salvatore Setis, what is lost of the great works of the past can be recovered if only we attend enough to cherishing what survives. Salvatore. Thank you so much, David, for your very generous introduction that makes me really worried because it is very, it is almost impossible to be, to uh, keep the promises that uh, you made in your introduction. Let me try. Uh, and uh, before starting, I wanted to, uh, can you hear me? Is, is it clear? I, I wanted to thank you, David, and Barbara Feida, and everybody here at the Italian Academy for this invitation. I enjoyed enormously being here, and I'm very grateful for this chance to present a small glimpse into a book project I'm supposed to work on, some reflections and hypotheses regarding the relationship between the Greco-Roman uh, drawing and Renaissance 
May I have the first slide, please? Slide. Okay. This relationship between um, classical drawing, Greek and Roman, and Renaissance drawing is in, fa in fact highly paradoxical. The great Renaissance masters, Leonardo and Raphael, for example, assiduously competed with the Greek masters for, from almost 2,000 years before, for instance, uh, Apelles or Parasius, without ever having seen one single antique drawing. The entire Renaissance drawing tradition was based on this obsession, on a sort of phantom model. The recreation of Apelles' subtle line, as well as the wish to have their own drawings empowered with the same representative qualities as those by Parasius. Many Greek or Roman drawings are known today, such as the famous Battle of Centaurs, uh, a drawing of marble in Herculaneum, which originally was polychrome, and much less famous architectural drawing on a papyrus from Oxyri and Cruz that was published a few years ago. And I will come back to this. The tension between presence and absence of the classical model to which I would like to draw your attention today is at the same time a tension between what the great Renaissance masters knew of antique drawings and what we know today, which is considerably more. Let me start by briefly commenting on a drawing from the heart of the Italian Renaissance by one of its most important masters, Correggio. It was done in red chalk, most likely represented Cupid and Psyche, and it is at the British Museum. Not only are the felicity of the line and the elegance of proportions evident, but so is the very consummate illustrative technique of the artist himself, that with the use of a single color is able to render the third dimension through his play with shadows. This effect, essential to Renaissance artists, is produced by means of a technique called hatching, tratteggio in Italian, achieved by drawing parallel lines of varying degrees of thickness, either horizontal, vertical or diagonal, in accordance with the result to be achieved. Hatching can also be carried out with curvilinear or zigzagging lines, or even more commonly with crossed lines, appropriately named cross-hatching, and you can see all this excuse me, all this uh, in several parts of this drawing. Um, a particularly heavy cross-hatching can bring about a sort of fusion of the lines into an apparently indistinct mass, like that found on the abdomen of the female figure on the drawing. However, the technique is generally reserved for the rendering of distinct tonal effects and volumes. Two additional points well displayed in a pen drawing by Paul Laiuolo, are equally important to understand the Renaissance drawing techniques and practices. The overwhelming importance of the contorno or contour line, a reinforced and dynamic line aimed at organizing an entire composition in a powerfully expressive way, and the differential thickness of the lines, at times thin and at times more full-bodied, with the obvious aim of suggesting depth. The line, in short, is the means and the protagonist of the contour of the drawing, the, of movement and thickness, and the in infinite variations of hatching. The challenge for the hand and gesture of the artist is always the same, to negate through drawing the inherent two-dimensionality and overwhelming flatness of the sheet onto which the drawing is arranged and ultimately champion spatiality and three-dimensionality. Let me go back now to a much more antique image, a very rare example of Greco-Roman drawing. It was traced on papyrus with a thin calamos or reed pen, the, in the Greek style, I mean with a pointed tip, dipped in black ink. It is from Oxyrhynchus and is now in Florence. It can be dated back to the second century BC and represents Psyche, uh, um, Psyche approaching Cupid, a scene described by Apuleius. However, this drawing, given its dimension, I will come back to this point, cannot possibly be a book illustration. 
The artist was able, with very few strokes, to render the movement of the limbs and muscles of Cupid reclining on a cline, as if at a banquet, right arm folded behind his head in a gesture of abandonment, as you can see here. The face was rendered with prominent eyes seemingly staring into space, practically without resorting to shadowing, but with just a few essential strokes. The delicate and intense composition is unique in the classical iconographical tradition as the artist chose to represent a moment suspended in time. The protagonist's eyes are not directed towards one another, but rather towards the viewer, almost as if pausing. We will never know what kind of drawing was it. Was it a drawing exercise? Or perhaps part of a workshop repertoire? Or still yet a preparatory sketch for a painting? We will never know. However, there are clear similarities between the Renaissance drawings we have just seen, like the judicious use of the dynamic contour line, that playing on the thickness of the line, diagonal hatching, shadowing with diluted ink, and other perspective tricks employed effectively renders the third dimension. This and numerous other affinities are obvious upon first glance, yet they are still difficult to explain, given that in the Renaissance not one single Greek or Roman drawing was known, as I've said. I'll show now two more examples, back to which I will later return. A zoological figure from the Artemidorus papyrus and a papyrus sheet from Munich representing a scene from the Iliad. The latter was executed using an Egyptian style, pencil-like reed pen that facilitated the alternation between more or less thick and intense lines with a very clear chiaroscuro effect. Despite the marked evidence in uh, the marked difference in quality, the similarities in the chiaroscuro effect with Correggio drawing are evident. At a distance of 11 centuries and employing significantly different techniques, uh, the common goal, creating a three-dimensional space on a flat page, inspired the gestural technique with a multitude of similarities playing on both the contour line and width of the stroke. Neither Correggio nor other Renaissance artists would have been able to derive this, these techniques from antique drawings. On the contrary, not only drawings, but also antique paintings were essentially ignored until the great discoveries in the 18th century of Herculanum and Pompeii. Let me now attempt to illustrate two intimately interconnected points. First, linear drawings were very important in the antique tradition, as testified by numerous Greek and Roman literary sources. Second, theorists and artists from the Renaissance itself, at least starting from Ghiberti, were well aware of how important drawing was in the context of Greek and Roman art, that they considered as their supreme model. Faced with the total loss of antique painting, they diligently sought to imagine the antique drawing practices by following three complementary tracks. First, the careful reading of classical literary sources. Second, reflections on optics and perspective. And finally, the assiduous study of what they had. And what they had were sculptures, not paintings ancient sculptures, in particular bas reliefs that were interpreted and drawn as pictorial things, in a distinctly pictorial manner. The relationship between antique and Renaissance drawing can therefore be centered on a void, an absence, but also on a prodigious tension, which was both artistic and moral, to fill that void with the strength of intellect and the ability of the hand. And these three different threads are more or less what my project is about. I will insist on one of them more than on the other two, but in, uh, in, in this lecture, I mean. Even when they wanted to affirm that the artists should not use models, imitating therefore nature directly, Renaissance artists and writers used to express this concept to a celebrated anecdote shown on the screen. The Greek painter Zuxis having been commissioned to paint the image of Helen, assembled the most beautiful young girls of Croton and sketched the preparatory design for his Helen, taking the most beautiful parts of the bodies of each of the girls, as shown in this, in this uh, imaginary painting 
However, Helen's perfect beauty that Zeuxis has a, a, attempted to recreate through a sort of collage of body parts suggests that the painter already had an idea of the beauty that he was searching for in mind, some sort of internal image. This concept, the idea, rooted in Platonic thought, was explored by Erwin Panofsky in a famous book, Idea, published in 1924, and by many authors. Nobody, though, expressed it better than Albrecht Dürer in a note from 1512, and I read it in translation. A good painter, writes Dürer, is internally full of images. And, and were it possible for him to live forever, he would constantly pick up something new from his own internal ideas, those Plato has written about and hand it over in his work. Wonderful quote from Dürer. Yet the Platonic internal idea would not have been sufficient if left un unfiltered by the tricks of the artistic trade. Dürer assiduously studied perspective and proportions in continuous dialogue with classical antiquity and Italian painters. Of his hand, we have here the famous illustration created for his Underweisung der Messung and a preparatory drawing. It is interesting to note not only the perspective grid used to correctly draw the human body, the grid being, sorry, the grid being here, but also, uh, but also the transition from purely contour design in the drawing to woodcut, the rich and knowledgeable use of hatching in all, all the variation I previously mentioned. In Italy, this interior idea was often referred to as disegno, a term that in Italian has the metaphorical meaning of intention, purpose, or project. In, in Italy we say, for instance, disegno di legge disegno di legge or bill. In Lorenzo Ghiberti's commentary, disegno, in the most literal sense, is the visible manifestation of the ingenuity of the artist. Semantically, this word covers a range that includes both the immaterial first intention formulated only in the mind of the artist and the first thought translated and materialized onto paper using the techniques of the art. The disegno, in this double sense, was at the heart of Leonardo's theoretical concerns. Leveraging the formation of the interior design, he wanted to raise the conditions of the painter from a merely artisanal realm to an elevated intellectual sphere. And it is exactly for this that his famous drawing of human proportions was constructed as a comment on a classical text, Vitruvius. Theorists of the, in 16th century Italy affirmed the unity of the figurative arts, architecture, painting, and sculpture by grouping them together under the category of arti del disegno. The thanks to Vasari's incredibly influential preface to his vite was commonly accepted throughout Europe, and I quote now a couple of lines from Vasari. Disegno. The father of our three arts draws its judgment from many things, and therefore it resembles a form or idea of all things found in nature. So disegno is the privileged key to enter in nature. According to this fortunate conceptualization, disegno is not only what the artist extends with his hand onto paper, but rather still earlier, a mental idea also referred to in Italian as disegno, that was essentially already formed in the mind of the creator, truly representing the original catalyst for every artistic creation, including poetry. Vasari translated this concept into the decoration of his house in Arezzo, here on the screen. It is amid these two meanings of disegno, idea, or in, the, in Italian, idea, is a mental form on the one hand, the actual drawing on paper on the other, that we must position every reflection on the relationships between antique and Renaissance drawing. And let me turn up now to two uh, heads in profile now displayed on the screen. The first is from the Artemidorus Papyrus, early 1st century AD, and the second is by young Leonardo from approximately 1470. Despite the considerable chronological and stylistic differences, the diversity between papyrus and paper, the Greek reed pen and pen, the affinities between the two drawings are stronger 
than the differences. Yet, Leonardo would have never seen this or any other antique drawing. When faced with a comparison such as this, one cannot but, but be surprised and even suspicious that perhaps the, this example on papyrus or any other drawings uh, on papyrus are indeed perhaps created more recently based on Renaissance works. But this is not the case. A similar startling effect is produced when comparing further examples such as this next case, the head of Hades from Vergina and the drawing from the school of Raphael. So you see this is in a Macedonian uh, kingly um, royal uh, tomb and this is from the school of Raphael. When observing the two, si the two side by side, one cannot but note the, the significant formal similarities, namely the vigorous use of shadowing in two works that would have had absolutely no relationship, direct nor through copies. Even harder to believe is though the continuity in practices and techniques from Greco Roman workshops to those of the Renaissance. The explanation for these affinities is certainly not continuity, is certainly not direct derivation, so we must look somewhere else. The explanation should be related to the assiduous study of literary sources, antique monuments, which represents the heart and soul of what we call, rightly so, the Renaissance. Rinascita, Rinascimento, new birth of classical antiquity. Regarding two aspects in particular, I repeat, Renaissance drawings are very similar to Greek Roman ones, namely through the dynamic contour line and the importance of shadowing. In the two profiles on the screen, the meaning of the line is evident, varied in its contour, movement and thickness. The similarities are not coincidental, but rather have deep cultural roots in the study, particularly in the study of light and techniques for illuminating both human figures and objects. This theme has been has been tackled both in antiquity and the Middle Ages and was brought to the forefront once again in the 15th century Italy in an extraordinary revival. Leonardo was very important in this respect. He carefully studied in particular the effects of rays of light on the human profile as we can see in the images displayed on the screen. In this instance, we can see the angle at which the light must hit the surface in order to create a certain amount of shade, which Leonardo then differentiated and classified. In his treatise on painting, never finished. The impasse to undertake his, this type of study reached him on a tortuous path from ancient Greece. In 1490, in Pavia, Leonardo studied, in fact, the treatise on, on optics by the Franciscan scholar Vitello, 13th century, which was based on Arabic sources that in turn were derived from Greek treatises. Equally, other treatises on optics also studied by Leonardo, such as those by John Peckham and Roger Bacon, were based on classical Greek sources filtered through Arabic translations and treatises. Leonardo, however, was not the first person to travel along this path. In this assiduous search for the tricks of the perspective representation of reality, he was preceded at least by Lorenzo Ghiberti, his terzo commentario is partially based on Vitello, by Piero della Francesca, Leon Battista Alberti, and Pisanello's, uh, and Pisanello's drawing now displayed is probably based on Alberti's indication. The sophisticated optical studies of Greek mathematicians gradually came back into circulation in Europe. Ptolemy's optics, before the original Greek text was lost, was translated into Arabic in Baghdad in the 9th century, and in the 13th century was translated from Arabic to Latin by Eugenius of Palermo. Euclid's optic, of which two different Arabic translations are known, was translated into Latin from Arabic and then from Greek, and we can first find traces of it in the De Pictura by Alberti. A page from the Codex Huygens in New York shows a scene from a workshop. On a, a, on a pedestal here, the, sorry, on a pedestal here, an hexagonal 
pedestal rests a candle and a small statue. A man, perhaps the workshop master, is leaning against the same pedestal. Two apprentices can be found on benches on either side. The left-hand figure, on its knees, traces the outline of the statue's shadow on the wall with a stylus, while the right-hand figure, seated, holds a piece of charcoal, yet seems hesitate or wait for his master's order. Will he sketch his own shadow or his master's? The Codex Huygens, though attributed to Urbino, to Carlo Urbino da Crema and dated approximately 1565, is based probably, most probably on materials that come from Leonardo. It is very important and really seldom observed that the figures in this scene are barefoot and dressed in antique attire. It was to be understood, therefore, as a scene set in classical antiquity. The gesture of sketching the outline of the shadow on the wall records the celebrated story of the invention of drawing as recounted by Pliny the Elder when he says that the drawing was invented by a girl who wanted to draw the image of her lover on the wall by through uh, outlining his shadow. The history of the, this return of the optical principles from Greek to Arabic to Latin is too complex to discuss further here. I brought, it to, uh, I, I brought it to your attention just to stress an important point. Ghiberti, Alberti, Leonardo, and Renaissance artists in general sought new rules of play for inspiration. Optical and mathematical studies conducted with the aim of creating an accurate perspective box reveal only part of the history. Two other sources, as already mentioned, in the context of this extraordinary intellectual vivacity were, were no less important. The first of which was, in absence of antique drawings and paintings, Roman sculpture, in which traces of pictorial knowledge of antiquity could be detected. And in that sculpture was considered, as we have seen, an arte del disegno. The other critical source on which I will, I, I will dwell more is classical sources. In the, almost total, in the almost total absence of antique paintings, Renaissance artists focused on pictorial quality of Roman reliefs. This is a long story and I will, uh, will not dwell on it, but uh, I'm, I'm showing you only one example. Let's look at a sarcophagus with a scene of clementia found in a drawing. So here you have the sarcophagus, a drawing from Cassiano del Pozzo's Museo Cartaccio, perhaps too generously att attributed to Poussin himself, but uh, um, certainly for that entourage, and uh, uh, a drawing that certainly served as a starting point for the composition of Poussin's Triumph of David in Madrid, 1630. Crowned by a, winged, uh, a, 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 a victory, just like the general scene on the sarcophagus, David, dressed all'antica against a classicizing architectural background, turns to a pile of weapons clearly after the trophy in the sarcophagus, except that the chained barbarian is replaced by the severed head of Goliath. In this, as in many other examples, drawing acts as an indispensable intermediary between the antique model and the painting, not only insofar as it preserved the composition of the Roman marble and made it portable, but more importantly, because it evidenced, indeed enhanced, the pictorial values of the classical relief and its chiaroscuro. I will not dwell on this point today, but rather, I will concentrate on the influence of literary sources. B before embarking on this theme, however, let me venture into a deliberate anachronism by showing you something that the Renaissance masters certainly never saw, a number of Greco-Roman drawings on papyrus, all discovered over the past 100 years. This drawing, about 1,000 are known, 50% of them unpublished, can help us better understand the techniques and methods of antique drawing, although we are only at the beginnings of this task. Against this backdrop, I should only brief mention here one important category of drawing, illustrated manuscripts. We can observe an astrological treatise from the 2nd century BC, here, and a literary text from the 2nd century uh, AD on the screen, both of which were illustrated with small, colorful drawings. Please note that the drawings are within the column of text. The, figure, the figurative drawings are 
always within the drawing of the text because these were not books, these were scrolls to be displayed this way. Uh, the, the, the book form we know, we are familiar with, started uh, growing and being important only from, uh, from the 3rd century AD on. In uh, the 2nd century AD, books were only 2% of book production, while in 5th century they were around 90%. It is important to note that the preservation of papyri was completely by chance. Apart from a few exceptions, they were found in Egypt, where the dry climate allowed for their preservation. They are essentially the fruit of a reverse selection, or better, they were not objects that were intentionally preserved. Most of the papyri were thrown away, and they were found in, um, um, among rubbish which is exactly the reason why they were found in rubbish dumps on the floor of abandoned houses, reused as material for papier mache or something like this. The few remnants of antique drawings are always fragmented, often in poor condition and poor quality. However, we're forced to use them in order to understand the drawings of great masters, because that's what we have. Uh, leaving aside manuscript illustrations, let me focus now on what we can generically call artists or workshops drawing. This is just to show you uh, that uh, in some cases we, you, you have, uh, uh, this is how a scroll was handed up and, uh, for an ancient reader, a totally different experience visually than we have in reading a book. You, can, you could have with a scroll six pages in front of you, not just two. So th this was really mm, different. And I'm also showing the continuity, so, uh, uh, some level of continuity in illustration. This is a, a, a fourth, fifth century illustration on papyrus. And we find in uh, a book uh, in, uh, in Naples and another one in, uh, in, in Vienna, the very same illustration showing that there is a continuity in this respect. Uh, the, um, the book illustration is one thing, other uh, drawings on papyrus are, are totally different. And the, the other drawings can be differentiated from manuscript illustration by their size, when they are too big to fit uh, within a column of text. This is the reason for which the sheet of Munich could not have been an illustration for a manuscript, despite corresponding to a passage in the first in the first book of Homer's Iliad, specifically the scene in which the two heralds of Agamemnon take the concubine, the reluctant Briseis, away from Achilles' tent. The drawing was executed with black ink by an expert hand and belongs to a long iconographical tradition that can be also shown in the Sacchia Doria in Palazzo um, Doria Panfili. Nor could the uh, Cupid and Psyche papyrus I've, sh I've been showing at the beginning have been for a manuscript illustration because it is very large. The same still can be said of a fragment from the 2nd century AD in Cairo, here, which depicts an imposing athletic figure holding a strigil disc. Let me show a few more examples. An, an example, a, a, a papyrus in Cairo depicting soldiers framed within a medallion is also a workshop sheet. The figure found in the left-hand margin of the fragment raises his arm in salute. So this is probably a part of a, um, a, 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 a an historic scene, including a, 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 the missing figure of a probably an emperor. The artistic render of the composition is masterfully pictorial and was achieved by modifying the angle of the reed pen. This is a, a characteristic gesture in order to modify the stroke and the effect of the stroke, making it more or less thick and intense as a way of creating the chiaroscuro effect. Similar to this piece, in terms of date and technique, is a study of Christ and apostles on the lake Tiberi on the, on the lake Tiberias. Given its simple contour drawing that Apostle's head behind the sleeping Christ are only roughly sketched, it was probably created to help the artist record the compositional idea. The contrast stands out between the figure of Jesus with a nimbus here, the nimbus, and 
and uh, the uh, 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 so Jesus is absorbed in uh, his lumber, right elbow resting on the edge of the boat, and the apostles in state of varying grades of terror due to the sudden storm. This is the moment when, when the, 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 the gospel says, when the, the, um, the, the apostle pronounced the words, Lord, save us, or we shall perish. And the Lord will soon awaken and command the winds and weather to settle, to then reprimand the disciples for, for their lack of confidence. The Vienna papyrus here is very rough. This is really very rough. But it includes several drawings of different hands. So this can be characterized as a sheet, as a workshop sheet of, in, of, of, of some sort. So the difference in quality between the, the drawing of the Silenus here and this very rough drawing of, of a woman is very, is clearly, is clearly evident. Let me show now uh, 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 again this quite exceptional drawing in Oxford, published just a few years ago. It represents the only known architectural drawing from classical antiquity on, on a mobile support. There are, there are some drawings of marble, uh, but uh, this is the only one. If we carefully observe it, we can see that be between the two columns in the frieze above, there is no structural connection. According to Helen Whitehouse, who, who, who published it, it was a student drawing probably from the second century AD. And of course, even here we might insist on similarities with the uh, Renaissance drawings. Workshop drawings for Weber's, as the sheet now on the screen, currently housed in V&A, represent an entirely separate category. More than 100 similar examples were collected by Anne-Marie Stauffer in a book on Antique Muster Blätter. We can see here Orpheus with a, a lyre, a figure crowning him, and a cat, and, and, and something very similar is in this drawing in Princeton. Drawings such as this must have been preserved within the workshop and used in multiple occasions, and there are several uh, proofs of this. Weaving techniques required that the weaver at the loom kept an eye on the cartoon, placing it just beyond the beam as they worked the threads into the design. And it was for this reason that the paradigmata, or models, for weavers are relatively commonplace. Their workshops had a much more pronounced industrial organization, perhaps as a result of the serial nature of their work and the use of machines such as looms. We also have from the Weaver's workshops in Egypt a number of contracts for apprentices. And several examples are here on the screen next to Penelope at the loom. I would like to conclude this overview on ancient papyri with the most complex case, the Artemidorus papyrus, which is on display in Turin. Uh, it is an ample fragment of a scroll, 32 centimeters high and two and a half meters long. Uh, the physical and chemical analysis, together with its paleography, dated at the beginning of the first century AD. I can only hint in the present context to the complex problems that this particular example raises. Like all antique scrolls, it was originally only used on one side, the recto, which is now on the screen, the same side uh, as text and uh, five columns of text, which you see appearing here, for instance, and two different types of illustration. A large map, yet not identified, the text is, can be partially identified with uh, the fragments of the geography by Artemidorus of Ephesus dating 100 years before the papyrus itself. And there are, but there are also a number of drawings, including faces, feet, and so forth. 25 drawings at, uh, in, in total. Before moving to the opposite side of the scroll, let me mention that this sequence I'm showing you was contested and is actually probably wrong. So the sequence of the sheets is different than what I'm showing you here. The opposite side of the scroll, its verso, was later reused to draw 40 images of real or fictional animals, either alone or in groups of two or three. They are all accompanied with a brief label and description. 
This papyrus scroll is a, absolutely a unicum, precisely for the three graphic devices that accompany the text. A map, a series of drawings on the verso, we are currently looking at animals and those found on the recto. This is why this particular item is now the object of so much discussion, which I cannot elaborate on today. One of the more problematic points is the temporal sequence of the various elements of which it is composed. Most probably, uh, first, the, 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 the text was put on the, on, the, uh, on the scroll and the map, which is supposed to illustrate the scroll, this is a geographical work, and then uh, the, the verso was reused, and then finally the blank spaces on the recto was, were used to draw um, human figures. Let me discuss very briefly the two series of drawings. The animals on the verso seem to be a sort of workshop repertoire, which would be the only extant examples from classical antiquity. There was a great discussion about this. Many of the, of the beasts found on papyrus can also be found elsewhere. Let me illustrate one particularly interesting example. The fight between two fictional animals, one of which, a sort of hippopotamus, with a, the, 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 the head of a crocodile, so it's a mix. It's called Xiphias by the inscription. The, uh, the inscription here reads Xiphias. Now in Palestrina, in the famous mosaic of Palestrina, there is the very same beast with a fragmentary uh, inscription that has been uh, mis reconstructed in the, in the Renaissance, but now it has been proved by as, uh, Irene Pajon Leira from Madrid, uh, she was able to prove that the right paleographic interpretation of this inscription is Xiphia, so the same beast, same inscription. Um, so. Let's hope it works now. Um, okay, it does. Um, uh, the, uh, there are also several other papyri. Um, in Oxford, there are m several papyri at the Ashmolean Museum from the uh, Oxford excavation, including this that was published uh, two or three weeks ago with new fragments uh, from a similar scroll with animals. The techniques, the ambitions, and limitations of these drawings can be observed in the most complex group, the only one including three animals and implying a narrative. We see here a, a griffin, called the grips by the inscription, leaping through the air while clasping a small leopard in his anterior clothes. The mother of the young leopard chases after the pair in vain, classified as pordalis in the nearby caption. The ground is suggested through clumps of grass through which peaks a round stone. The running leopard, head raised high and turning to, towards the back, is covered with spots quickly applied with the point of a red, of a red pen and diluted, um, and, and diluted with uh, uh, diluted ink. The long swinging tail is charged with the expressive function of suggesting rapidity of movement. The griffin, on the other hand, unfolds her two powerful wings whose plumage is rendered with long strokes of a broad point red pen and grey ink. As Yash Elsner pointed out, quote, if this scene alone had survived, scholarship would surely have been besotted with a masterpiece of ancient drawing, the cartoon for some imaginary and, ma and major painting. The figure drawings on the recto, which we can now see, Several examples appear to be exercises. For example, the same foot is drawn twice by two different hands. None of the drawings forms a complete figure, rather only separate heads, hands and feet are found. None of them can be interpreted as having been drawn after a leaf model. They are in fact often characterized as objects in the round. You see that they are there is a, the upper part. The oval upper part shows that they are actually drawn after plaster models, plaster casts, or marble, or object in some other material. The drawings might therefore have been made after plaster casts that were frequently found in workshop of sculptors or painters. The drawings of the head 
of the head seem to have served as an, addition, an additional purpose, namely the effective depiction of the face and its physiognomic expressiveness. The use of perspective and spatial illusions is rich and accurate, and the chiaroscuro is employed occasionally to suggest the modeling and the subtle chromatic rendering of the entire composition. The analysis of, of, of those drawings, which I cannot dwell upon, sh showcases a variety of techniques and gestural devices through the use of shading that neatly correspond to the framework that can be built around antique drawing and that will reappear identically in Renaissance drawing. All the type of hatching and shadowing that I have mentioned before and that are mentioned frequently by ancient sources. For instance, Philostratus, in his Imagines, praises painting as an art that, quote, mostly shines in the use of shadows. That's Philostratus. As I said earlier, no Renaissance master was ever able to see to see uh, drawings like this. It was only from classical literature that they did know something about the drawings of the Greek painters, and that's my last point today. Petrarch was probably the first to have creatively attempted to the combined reading of Pliny and Quintilian to understand the work of antique masters. He was very interested, I mean, Petrarch in the visual arts. He had the Madonna by Giotto and commissioned Simone Martini, a portrait of Laura and the splendid full-page miniature of the Virgil, which is now on the screen. In 1350, Petrarch bought in Mantua a quite incorrect manuscript of Pliny's Natural Historia, and it was in the, margins, in the margins of this book that he sketched with his own hand a symbolic drawing of Rome, here, adding, uh, the, uh, accompanying the image with the words, quote, nothing has even, has even been so admirable in the whole world. In the same year, he came to possess an incomplete manuscript of Quintilian Institutio Oratoria. In De Remedis Utriusque Fortuna, Petrarch inserted the chapter about ancient painting and another about sculpture, and he took from Pliny and Quintilian and combined expression from Pliny and Quintilian, bringing together the points they had in common. And he noted that linear drawing is at the origin of both painting and sculpture. So therefore, Petrarch is the very origin of the theory of Arte del Disegno. Classical literary sources offer a historical narration of art, centered around the idea of progression, as evident in a passage of Quintilian, in which he parallels the development of three art forms, oration, sculpt or, uh, or eloquence, sculpture and painting, which certainly reflect the lost Greek treatises of art history, because the Greeks ac actually had a whole literature on art history from uh, the 3rd century BC on, at least. Awareness of this continuity between the styles of art in the past had its impact even on Roman art, which can be seen, for instance, here in Villa della Farnesina, where the painted architecture frames a painting here of a more recent style than the two paintings at its sides. At the center of the main space, we can see the young Dionysus among the nymphs of Nyssa in late Hellenistic style, while on, a, on, on either side, we have two almost monochrome framed painting with white, with white backgrounds, an ostensibly archaic style, and almost as if they were part of a collection. Let me comment on this wall with a passage by the Dionysus of Alicarnassus, 1st century BC, in which the development of rhetoric was compared with that of painting. Quote, Antique pictures were simple in coloring, not intermixed with, with, uh, with everything else, but rather precise in their design, and from this stems their grace. The more recent works are inferior in design, but more elaborate with their coloring and chiaroscuro. So in, in these words, these are the ancient paintings, most ancient, and this is the, mo the most recent. The turning point in Greek painting for Quintilian was represented by the near contemporary painters Zeuxis and Parasius, late 5th century BC. Both marked, he says, a notable progression in painting. This process was described in terms of the Greek model of Protos Heurethes. 
the first finder of something. Both painters introduced specific but opposing craftsman devices. And I quote from Quintilian, Zuxis first introduced within painting techniques the relationship between light and shadow, concentrated on the plasticity of the limbs and the body, convinced that this attention lent a much more majestic presence to his figures. Unquote. A vigorous colorist, Zuxis, however, pinks it, uh, painted also monochromata, employed a single color, and we, uh, like, like what we can see in this Herculanum painting. In another passage, Quintilian clarifies, he who uses a single color to paint must do so in such a way that some things appear in the forefront and others in middle ground. Without this artifice, the contour line is in vain. So the contour line should express depth. On the contrary, continues Quintilian, Parasius devised the increased refinement of the lines of the drawing. And I'm quoting, he knew, Parasius, how to draw the contour lines with such ability, so remarkably so, that he, he earned the name law maker of drawing and to such a degree that other painters emulated, almost if obligatory, his models of gods and heroes, very much as he had made them exemplary for the subsequent visual tradition." Unquote. The competition between Zuxis and Parasius is a central topos in the history of antique painting, and is often found in the Greek or Roman literary tradition. This, uh, this rivalry made its way into an anecdote, as recounted by Pliny, that we can see in drawing and engraving by Zandrart. And this is the anecdote. It has been said that Parasius had a contest with Zuxis. Zuxis painted a bunch of grapes so perfectly that a flock of birds actually tried to eat them. And Parasius, on the other hand, had painted a curtain and painted it so realistically that the same Zuxis, so proud of his success with the birds, asked for the curtain to be lifted so that he could see the painting underneath. So Zuxis soon realized to have been fooled, and with his admirable honesty, conceded victory to Parasius. I, he said, was able to trick the birds, however you were able to trick me, and I am a painter. Now let me show for a minute a little wonderful painting just bought by the Metropolitan Museum, which is very likely the oldest extant Renaissance representation of Zuxis' grapes, with a bird eating them. And as Keith Christensen pointed out, Creval Core was compared to Zuxis by a contemporary poet, Filoteo Achillini. But the anecdote about the contest between Zuxis and Parasius is much more than the competition among two equally gifted painters. Rather, it is about a general competition between color and drawing. Zuxis' grapes, painted so cleverly with chromatic chiaroscuro, succumbed to Parasius' curtain, which was monochromatic. So the, uh, it's a contest between drawing and between monochromatic drawing and painting. This anecdote affirms the supremacy of drawing over color, and this can be seen even more clearly in the famous, the most famous and difficult passage of Pliny the Elder about Parasius. Let me read and comment on this while we are showing. We are looking at, uh, for purely evocative purpose, several painted vases, more or less, from the time when Parasius was living. So this is Pliny. It was Parasius from Ephesus who first introduced the symmetry and expressive details of the face of, to painting, as well as the elegance of hairstyles and the beauty of the lips. The other artists themselves agree to place him at the very top of drawing's mastery, which is the highest artifice for the pictorial arts. Rendering bodies or the surface of objects with color is a notable feat, yet it has been successfully achieved by many. Much rarer are the artists that have been able, like him, to draw the contours of bodies, interrupting the lines to foreshorten the figure. It is, in fact, the contour line that must curve around itself, curve around itself. It must be possible to guess where it is interrupted, or, so to speak, what else it hides behind itself, what is behind the line. In short, it must also be able to show what it hides. This is 
the line of Parasius. This is the high praise that is bestowed upon him by Antigonus and Xenocrates, authors on, of treatises on painting, Greek authors of treatises that are unfortunately lost. They did not limit themselves to just recognizing Parasius' merits, but they translated them into a precept of art. Many of Parasius' drawings, says Pliny, on wood and parchment survive to this day and are still used by artists to their great advantage. Only, uh, only, only witness from classical antiquity that uh, drawings by great, uh, by great masters could be preserved as we do today. Among all the passages from ancient sources that speak of antique drawing, this is the most important by far and the most authoritative between uh, among Renaissance artists. Um, the, uh, the, the, in, in, in this passage, the mention of Graphidis Vestigia, the drawing of Palacios, is very important. The great Italian archaeologist Bianchi Bandinelli invested a great deal of energy into the elusive passage of Pliny on Parasius' drawing. He attempted to trace in particular the similarities between it and uh, actual painting tradition in Athens, particularly of this painter whom he loved, whom Bianchi Bandinelli loved particularly. Parasius' contour line as argued by Bianchi Bandinelli was, a, was a, he calls a functional line linea funzionale, on the borderline between a new conception of drawing, no longer limited to just outlining figures, but aimed at interpreting three-dimensional volumes through chromatic and luministic devices. Paresio's functional line then truly corresponds to Pliny's description, and therefore, Bianchi Bandinelli goes on, when outlining a body, it did not only determine the surface areas, but was able to create relation of volumes. This can be seen also, uh, what, not just in what the sources say about Parasius, but other uh, in uh, exquisite drawn exper drawing experiments uh, shown in particular uh, the, the, the tendency to want to obtain plasticity through shading with quick parallel lines can be shown by contemporary analysis with modern technologies here. If you see this, this, um, uh, 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 this vase, you will not recognize lines, but uh, with uh, um, uh, UV light, you can see that there was a, a hatching quite similar to those uh, can, that we can see in the, uh, in the um, uh, figures of the Artemidos, Artemidos papyrus, and the ultraviolet uh, an analysis can show, very, can show it very clearly. The crucial importance of the contour line for plastic rendering and for its function is expressively expounded in another celebrated anecdote also recounted by Pliny, namely the contest between two 4th century BC painters, Apelles and Protogenes. And that's uh, the short version of it. Apelles suddenly shows up at Protogenes' workshop in uh, Rhodes and asks after the master who had left. The old woman at the workshop asks for his name in order to be able to deliver the message, but Apelles responds by drawing a line. He says, when he will see this line, he will understand who I am. And then, uh, and, and then Apelles goes away, and, 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 and Protogenes came back home, he sees the line, and he draws another line, more subtle than the one of Apelles, and then goes away. And then Apelles comes back and draws a more, an even more subtle line. So and uh, they uh, and, and finally they meet at the harbor, and they agree on keeping the canvas as a testimony to their context. And then the canvas was uh, was was later brought to Rome. There are um, uh, a, a, at least forty or fifty different uh, attempts at reconstruction. This this I'm I'm showing all the most improbable, but very nice because it is the, uh, the by Catrimer you can see a neoclassical imagination. But the uh, real point is uh, if, uh, that this, uh, uh, this course, uh, um, ancient art history, but also history, is mostly done through anecdotes. They have a demonstrative quality. This discourse can be interpreted as a further development of Parasius' intu intuition and experimentation. The thinner the line, the better it can wrap around itself and therefore compete with color in order to express the plasticity of figures and the third dimensions.
From 15th century on, from Petrarch on, I should say, passages like this were avidly read, and the Parasius line became a sort of phantom model, an unreachable objective, a perpetual challenge. Alberti, in his treatise, in his treatise on painting, 1435, uh, asserts the importance of the contour line, circonscrizione, and exalts Parasius' fame in this regard, or better raises Parasius' prestige, reminding the reader of what Pliny and, and, uh, 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 says, but also reminding the, that Xenophon placed uh, Parasius has having conversation with Socrates, so there is also a philosophical dimension to it. This chin's conscription, according to Alberti, must be executed with very thin lines, so subtle, in fact, that they may disappear from view. The price of this tenuitas thinness of the lines perhaps explain the expression opus tenue in the inscription in the Camera degli Sposi by Andrea Mantegna in Mantua 1474, another text which celebrate, which, uh, which celebrate Mantegna's tenuitas as a virtue of the painter, perhaps referring precisely to the delicateness of his all'antica contour line. The tension between Theoretical and practical reflection on drawing is best captured by Leonardo. Okay, by Leonardo. In linear drawing, he writes, due diligence, I'm quoting, must be employed considering the terms, i.e. the contours of the body and their snaking appearances. The two drawings on the screen exemplify the close relations between contour lines and shadowing. In addition, they illustrate Leonardo's experimental conception of the functional contour line, to use Bianchi Bandinelli's expression, in competition with Parasius' phantom model. This is, why, this is why the painter must submit to contour lines, as Leonardo says elsewhere, where the path of the line straightens, when the line twists in one direction or another, and when it is more or less evident, or wider, or thinner. This is what Leonardo calls the linea serpeggiante, or twisting line, the line that sl slithers across the page, like a snake, the highest challenge of the art, or if you wish, a true evidence for the primacy of drawing. Um, attributed to Michelangelo was the saying, in this consists the secret of painting, creating of the serpentine, pyramidal figure, because the most graceful and lovely figure is one that looks as being in motion, and this is what painters refer to as la furia della figura, the fury of the figure. Michelangelo's serpentine line, no less than the twisting line of Leonardo, is nothing, however, if not the line of Parasius, that which According to Pliny, quote from Pliny, must curve around itself and it must be possible to guess where it is interrupted or so to speak what else it hides behind itself. In short, the line of Parasius must also be able to show what it hides. In his wonderful Windsor drawing, Michelangelo offers a superb example of this fury, of this furia delle figure. And it is interesting to say that he, he does it starting but from this very poor, comparatively, painting in the Domus Aurea. So from here to, to Michelangelo's drawing, you see that the power of reconstruction, the power of the disegno della mente. This is, in fact, the paradox we are dealing with by, of the great Renaissance masters, which changed the course of Italian and European art with a tremendously originality and creative force. Every line was drawn under the watchful eye, so to speak, of the ancients, from a broken stucco in a grotto, the Domus Aurea, visited by torchlight, as well as from tortuous passages of Pliny and Quintilian, rose a powerful challenge, a stimulus, to create something new while reviving the past. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.
So, Professor Setis has agreed to ask uh, some questions. I'm sure you have many of them. I mean, the mystery remains, doesn't it, Salvatore, that we have these great sculptures from antiquity. And we have, so, by any standards, they uh, come close to all our imagination would require of aesthetic yeah. complexity. <clears throat> and here we have so few so small evidence of the drawings. I mean, in a way, the best thing of the, the possibilities of drawing, in a way, the best thing was the um, Berlin drawing, which you showed under ultraviolet light, which yeah. is a kind of complexity <clears throat> yeah. that we couldn't imagine. So is it just a matter of the conservation of yeah. the drawing? Well, this is a matter of conservation, but this is also a matter of how they were, uh, they, they had such a um, <clears throat> desire, an ardent desire to look for, uh, that they interpreted the reliefs as drawings. There is a, a wonderful passage by uh, Chanteloup about Bernini, when he says that uh, he attributes to Bernini, he says that Bernini used to say that the reason why drawing was better uh, uh, in, in Florence and, uh, and Rome than in Venice is that in Venice there is no column of Trajan. And the, the, the column of Trajan is the source of all drawing, and he uses the word drawing. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I think I insisted on sources, which is a more complex point, sources and, and optics. But uh, if we look, uh, you know, I think there is a, an important point here, because when we look at drawings by, uh, by classical masters after sarcophagy, for instance, we tend to interpret them, which is certainly a very important part of the story, as uh, uh, the, the, as a product of, the, uh, of uh, the willingness to create a corpus of classical antiquity, which certainly Cassiano had in mind, for instance. This is his one aspect. But then another aspect was to capture, through drawing, the pictorial quality of the relief itself. And I think that it is by, making, by putting those, two, uh, those three things together, uh, readings of optical devices, in reinterpretation of optic, optical treatises, which they knew were coming from uh, classical antiquity through Arabic treatises, first the ancient sources and the interpretation of classical reliefs as drawings, as pictorial, for, for their pictorial qualities. If, if, if you put those, two, those three things together, this would be my uh, imaginary uh, book project, which I will never finish. But anyway, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> Questions from you, I've given you time. <clears throat> Cannot all have been so conclusive, I find that hard to believe. Do we see a hand? One. I have another question. Hi, I, um, just a, a fast question. Where would you place inside this schema you're um, showing us the, um, the idea of uh, Jean Cézneck uh, on the role of the, of the, or the importance of the manuals for the recovery of, um, um, of the images of, of, of the past? Uh, such as of mythologies. The man, well, the manuals of, of mythology were very important to um, for the tradition of, of more of, uh, of of the subject matter, myths and, and, and things like this. But there are also manuals of paintings, of course, which I I, I didn't mention. There were the manuals uh, coming from Mount Athos. Which, uh, which it is contested whether or not they have a, a classical content. And there are, there, there are a number of uh, very minor texts, such as Mappe Clavicula, or things like this, where you can trace back some minute uh, uh, allusion to ancient paintings. Uh, I, I think Sesnek was very important in, uh, um, in pointing out how important it was for um, uh, uh, 
late Middle Ages and early Renaissance to be inspired by, by, by mythological manuals in choosing the, the subject for what, uh, for what they were. Uh, but in, in, those, in those manuals there is, the, 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 they are not il illustrated regularly and, the, and, and there is, I think, um, very little in terms of um, style or technique of, uh, of painting. But there are many, many other sources. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been quoting only, 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 only Pliny and Quintilian, but there is much more. And they were so avidly r reading the sources. I mean, not, not necessarily the artists themselves, who mostly didn't know a word of Latin or, or Greek, but, 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 uh, but, but persons belonging to their, um, to, 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 to the same city or to the same port or, or to the same milieu. Let me ask you one other question in case the audience needs time for thinking this through. The line of Apelles. I always remember, you remember Gombrich's article on the line of Apelles. Sure. Some of you will know this, in which the line of Apelles was not two separate things, as you see in the Quatre Mer de Quincy, but Protogenes, Apelles draws a line, then Protogenes draws a line on top of that line, and then Apelles comes back and draws the third line. Yeah. And the aim of that, according to Gombrich, was to produce a sense of relief, which to some extent fits yeah. Yeah. your drawing. And there is, I always like doing this, it is, it is a further article to be done on the amount of times this was actually used by Renaissance and Baroque artists who knew this. And if you look, for example, at Rembrandt's self-portrait in the Boston Museum, the side of the easel which jumps out yeah. at you has one line superimposed on another line and it produces this great effect of relief. Yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, the, 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 this passage has been interpreted in several different ways. There is an article, I don't remember the author now, an article of some, something like 10 or 15 years ago listing something like 18 different interpretations of these lines, including uh, I, uh, one of the most improbable is the one by Catherine de but uh, uh, probably uh, as improbable as, as this is the idea that the second line was on top of, the, uh, w was within the first one, and the third was within the second. So, uh, the, and in this case, the subtlety would uh, would uh, would be even, even more visible. The reality is that. We don't. We, we will. Uh, it's it's impossible to know. It's uh, it's impossible to know. But it is very interesting. I think the only, we have to take uh, the anecdote not as something um, as uh, an archaeological finding in order to reconstruct as uh, you, you know Botticelli reconstructed the calumny of Apelles based on the description by Lucian. That's not something we have to do. I think the starting point should be uh, full awareness of the demonstrative nature of anecdotes in classical biography. So anecdotes were told not for their importance, not as chapters of a biography, but in order to show something in order to demonstrate something. And uh, uh, I think that what this anecdote wants to show is the importance of the subtleness of the line. So that's, whatever the interpretation, that's the only point that, that's, uh, to my mind, relevant, really relevant. So in, 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 in these, uh, Looking at the demonstrative uh, power of anecdotes, I find interesting that uh, when you look at the example of the monochrome curtain and the polychrome uh, basket of fruits, uh, the monochrome curtain was eventually the winner as uh, demonstrating a more realistic uh, representation of space. And of course the brain, uh, we do perceive uh, at, at the brain uh, neurological level depth based on luminance contrast, chiaroscuro. And the challenge for the painter is really uh, maintaining um, a unity of tone using colors that allow that chiaro and scuro to be perceived and thus represent depth. Is it formulated anywhere or described anywhere other than these, uh, in, this, in this anecdote that 
it is exactly the, the going from uh, bright to dark that suggests space and depth. Well, uh, one thing I'm doing, and which I, I, I could not include in this talk, is collecting uh, um, sources, Greek sources talking about shadow and line. And there are many. There are many describing the, 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 the contrast between precisely what you, you, you have said. Your observation is, is, is very um, uh, appropriate, I think. And uh, the, uh, the interpretation of uh, the curtain as drawing is mine. Is, is my interpretation, uh, but I, I, it is based on the on the languages by Pliny, and and uh, in in comparison with many sources, fr from Philostratus to other sources, and particularly, it's uh, now you can do these sort of things because you have thesaurus, lingua Grecia, and you 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 can uh, you can uh, you can put the word for shadow, and you you find a million things, of which only one percent is actually what you would like to find, but. Uh, uh, with some time, you, you, you can find quite a bit of, of, of different things. So I think that uh, what has never been done is to put all those things together, because uh, classical archaeologists normally work mostly on uh, the uh, usual suspects, Pliny, Quintilian, Pausanias, and so forth and so on. But there is much more, because the discourse on art in the Greek and Roman world was very uh, uh, common among uh, connoisseurs or, or, or among cultivated people. And uh, the very existence of a, of a literary genre, the very fact that there were treatises on, on, on painters, treatises on sculptors, and uh, as early as the late fourth and 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 third century and, and third century BC, and and, and that Pliny or other sources quote from them. So we have, we have fragments. So art history was not born in Italy in in uh, in the fifteenth century as uh, as many used to say, but was born in Greece. Uh, long before, and that's uh, that's uh, 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 and reconstructing the, the 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 lost works is impossible. But having an idea of the general discourse on art, including what they would call schiagraphia, there is a, a, a very uh, a very typical word, schiagraphia, which means drawing with shadows, with a philosophical implication. There is. Plato is talking about schiagraphia, and the interpretation of schiagraphia in Plato is very difficult, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't, even, I didn't uh, even mention this. So my, uh, the interpretation I'm, I'm proposing of the uh, of the curtain is based on a vast uh, um, archipelago of other quotations I'm not using in this in in this talk. But uh, if I ever will be able to put together the book I have in mind, uh, I think I will. I will offer more evidence in this respect. Okay. Um, I just have a question regarding Renaissance treatises and Renaissance authors. Is there any text in Vasari, or does Vasari ever mention, or any of the other Renaissance authors, that um, drawing needs to be revived because it collapsed after antiquity? Because Vasari says that drawing is the basis of all, all three arts. So you would think that maybe one of the reasons that the arts collapsed, so, so to speak, during the Middle Ages is because drawing was lost. Is there any clear reference to this idea? You there? A good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm able to respond now. I don't have in mind a, pas a, a specific passage. Uh, there are millions of passages saying, speaking about the um, end of uh, art in the ancient, uh, in, uh, with the end of, of the Roman Empire, the barbarians arriving, and these sort of things. But they speak generally of all the arts, not of one specific thing, one specific thing. And uh, uh, when talking about uh, mm, uh, classical art, they, what, uh, they knew there was a lot of painting. They knew there was Parasius and the palace, but uh, they didn't see almost any uh, ancient painting. Though in, in Rome something was found, including the Domus Aurea we were, uh, we're looking at. So I, 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 I think that given the assumption that uh, um, 
the design is the base for all arts, they would not care so much about finding, about, find, uh, about reviving the design per se, but rather the, the, the drawing as part of a common theory of the, of, the, of the arts. And they would have never dreamed of Greek papyri in Egypt to be found uh, uh, five centuries later, because the, 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 uh, all, all the findings of Greek papyri are, 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 are really much, much later, so they, they didn't have... Uh, I, I don't have in mind any specific passage uh, speaking about, about drawing. Speaking about painting, yes. And, and painting and drawing were, uh, were seen as very close, of course. One last question from I just wanted to ask you, I thought the most striking example was the early Leonardo drawing in the Uffizi and with the Turin. And of course you can make a distinction between Michelangelo, Leonardo, or then Donatello, that there's a history of the reception of antiquity that goes importantly to some of what you're talking about, not just stimulating a new response, but I wanted to ask you about Marzia Fayetti has written about the Leonardo being influenced by Mantegna, that was even possibly a think, dis distinguishing between Roman and Greek ideas, a little bit what Regal formally did in, in art history. And I would have thought that was one place where you could have perhaps made more connections or there's something's been lost that for me, I thought it can't be just that one papyrus or there's drawings lost. Leonardo must have been drawing on things that we don't know about anymore. Uh, he paid a lot of attention to uh, to whatever was um, coming from classical antiquity, though he would never uh, simply uh, content himself with copying or drawing just for antiquarianism of some sort. He would rather absorb and recreate. That's what. Uh, and uh, n uh, without knowing that Marzia, who is a friend of mine, was working on uh, on more or less the same thing from another point of view, she wrote something that it is actually converging with with what I'm I'm I'm, I'm working on. In the, let me put it this way: in the economy of this talk, I only mentioned this to open a window on something that I didn't, uh, um, I, uh, I, I, I couldn't go in, in any depth because I, I just wanted to point out that the, um, the importance of classical sources and of, of reading them in conjunction with drawing after ancient reliefs and with this, this great background of optics which is considered a separate realm but it, it is actually the same thing also because they knew. They, that uh, uh, optical devices came uh, from classical antiquity, Th though uh, for some reason studied bo mostly by Franciscans in the 13th century, and there is, this is a long story, as, as you know. Well, Salvatore, thank you so much for... <laughs>